Great. Thank you very much for having me today, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so, if, if this is okay with you, I'd like the talk to be a bit more interactive. I know I'm standing between you on lunch, which is a horrible uh, thing to be doing. Uh, so, the talk's going to be kind of a different focus from the previous one, and we're going to be moving to the field of sound for film. And I'm going to be presenting on the Enhancing Audio Description Project, which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And it's a collaboration between the Departments of Electronics and the Departments of Theatre, Film and Television at the University of York, with a co collaboration with Anglia Ruskin University. And the project is in its 20th month. Uh, it was um, meant to finish at the end of November, but we got an extension so that we can do a bit further work. And what I'm going to be asking you today to do is to imagine what it is like to just listen, not see anything. This is the experience that many people have when they go to the cinema or they watch television and they're visually impaired. As most of us sighted people, we generally don't stop to think about what a person that is totally blind or partially sighted experiences when they're there in the cinema next to us. So I'm going to ask you to do that. And I'm going to play just an audio section of the start of a film. And I would like you to think what is happening. And there's no visuals. But I'm going to ask you afterwards what you thought was happening, and what you were confident about, how many people there were, uh, anything that you can think about. So are you ready? Yay! That's the right response. <laughs> Child having a problem? Child? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, anything else? First of all, they might be in space because of the heavy breathing. Oh, okay, all right. That's the first time I've heard this. <laughs> Interesting, I know, it. yeah, okay. Yeah. Some have some water in some stages, there's a lot of some splashing water about. Okay, anything else? Any other guesses? I thought it was night. Night time? Okay, why? I don't know. It's, um, Okay. Any other guesses? Thought it might be the chair. <coughs> okay, cool. Any other guesses? Because I think they are guesses. <laughs> I, I thought it was a medical examination as well. I was probably biased, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. involved. No, you weren't. You were correct. <laughs> <laughs> it is a medical examination, and it's actually a coincidence, by the way. I shouldn't have said it was planned. Uh, so I'm going to show you what uh, the clip is. Actually, can we switch off the lights? Because the clip is quite dark. I, I've asked a very difficult question. Where are the light switches? Anybody can find the light switch. It's a very dark film, so otherwise we're going to read. Oh, cool. That's better. Good. So, anybody knows what uh, visual impaired people use if they want to go to the cinema or watch a film? Audio description. Audio description. And what is audio description? Someone telling them what's going on alongside the normal dialogue and effects. Exactly. It's a pre recorded commentary that describes uh, with um, words not just what's happening on the screen, but also any sound effects, any sound elements that might have been deemed difficult to understand without the visuals. And that decision is made by uh, the audio description company that both scripts and reports uh, that audio step. Now I'm going to show you that start sequence, a sequence of this film with the audio description. This was um, commissioned to an audio description company, and this is what they gave. Moving towards a bed in a large, gloomy room in daytime, everything's slightly blurred. There, a young woman, Margaret, is sitting up, facing a window of bright light. Her dark, wavy hair hangs loosely down her back. Curtains frame the window, and a small lamp glows to the right of it. An older woman, June, stands beside the bed, watching her. The glare from the window dims, and the image focuses. June quickly pulls back Margaret's hair, then puts a metal bucket down in front of her, which Margaret picks up. Another woman walks in. June. I don't know what happened. It's worse this time. The second woman, Cecily, quickly examines Margaret, then puts an oxygen mask on her. Margaret's back is covered in raised red bruises. Margaret's hands push down on the bed covers. The muscles on her back move. Cecily pulls the oxygen mask away, and June holds the bucket beneath Margaret's mouth. Something small flies out of her mouth and lands in the bucket. Cecily takes it away, and June comforts Margaret. And I see. Sitting at a small wooden desk with her back to them, Cecily uses a pair of tongs to fish a white pearl out of the bucket, then inspects it. She drops it into a metal tray, then marks it in a notebook on a page already filled with scores of tally marks. Margaret pushes down on the bed again and grasps the dark green sheet. She coughs blood up onto the sheet. Cecily runs to her, bringing the bucket. She wipes blood from Margaret's mouth. June steps back, horrified, and tries to wipe the blood off her own arms. Margaret's hunched over. <coughs> Cecily stands on one side of the bed, June on the other, looking anxious. Margaret lifts her head back, revealing another white pearl lying in the bottom of the silver bucket in a pool of dark red blood. Title, Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is a typical audio description track. Anything particular that you noticed that you liked or you didn't like? I like the fact that they, they well, liked this 
sarcastic joke. But uh, the dark green sheet. I don't know how they got that, because I don't think that's dark green at all. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Anything that you liked, you didn't like? Well, it's a very boring piece of storytelling. It's okay. always to tell that story. I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't start anywhere near just reading out what looked like a, just a plain description. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more the gentleman like to the gentleman here at the front? Uh, the emotion being conveyed in um, the audiovisual medium, not conveyed just through the audio description, is completely neutral. Okay. So the emotion in the okay. So I think there was someone. Yeah, I think, I think, so I think that the actual sound design was lost. Mm -hmm. There was a focus primarily on the narrative, so it may as well have been just a talking book with yeah. no sound effects. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? I think uh, there was a real issue with the tone of voice, but it's pitch. And, uh, that it sounded more like a documentary than it did actually a drama type of presentation. It was a lack of modulation. Um, and, and again, this disjuncture between the visuals and actually the, what you would expect and the rate yep. and to draw the audience in and emotion. Um, and that there are sort of choices that make it a really different experience like watching it and you don't know that they're called June and mm. Margaret and suddenly, and suddenly you've got all this extra information that's sort of a bit distracting. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, there are some things that were described that as a sighted person, I couldn't see in, in, in the narrative of what you yep. me that weren't that, that, weren't that mm -hmm. clear to me and were yep. kind of being revealed by it, but were made very explicit by the audio description. Also, I mean, these descriptions sounded like they were geared towards sighted people rather than sighted people of blind people. What makes you think that? The, the, the green sheet, for example. Uh, well, uh, people might have lost their sight afterwards in life. They, know, yeah. they might know what green means. So that is kind of, it's a contentious issue, uh, the notion of colour in relation to blindness, because some people might have lost their sight when they were 20, for example. So their notion of colour is present. Uh, if someone was born blind, then of course it has maybe no, not much of a meaning. So that the last thing? I think the, um, some of the original audio was lost because it was, they had some really intricate sound design and the voice was sort of very loud and just drowned all that out. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you kind of pretty much uh, did uh, my job for me. Because <laughs> uh, all those are, the first thing, uh, all those were negative things. But let's say actually the one that is really positive. That is that audio description is the only accessibility service available for visually impaired people. If it doesn't exist, you don't have another option. So to me, it's very, very important, regardless of uh, the problems it might have, that it continues to be produced. Because otherwise, we're leaving a lot of people without any access to cultural experiences. Can I Even... Can I, can, I, can I just continue, please? Uh, even now, in broadcasting, it's only 20% of broadcast material goes with audio description. So if what you want to watch doesn't have audio description, well, you will have to just watch the original soundtrack and maybe have the experience that you had at the start of this session, where you actually, it could have been anything happening. Or you have to uh, rely on a sighted person to whisper in your ear what's happening, which is not ideal if you would want to create a society where people with disabilities have independence. So this is kind of the very important aspect that we do need to remember about audio description. It does also give people a lot more confidence. So, say you are uh, you're a kind of a, I don't know you're a university student, an undergraduate student, uh, you're visually impaired, and you want to discuss uh, the Game of Thrones episode uh, when you go to uh, to class the following day. You don't want to be worrying about whether you understood or not. You want to be confident so that you can discuss it with whoever happens to be in your class. Okay? So that is a very, very valuable thing that audio description gives to visually impaired people. But as you said, it's not perfect. So one of the things that came up from your comments was that idea that we no longer can hear that original sound design. So if any of you in the room work in sound design, film, television, or for theatre, uh, you probably know that everything that is put into that soundtrack has a specific intention. So if we're good sound designers, we don't just chuck things there just for the sake of it. There is a motivation, something that has to do with the story and with the emotional part of the scene. The same way that every cut in every film has a motivation, or it should have anyway. So that's an important thing. We put that verbal commentary and everything else starts being very difficult to hear. Then the idea of the tone came up in your comments. And the idea that it's monotonous, 
Now, someone could argue that audio description is there to be objective, if such a thing exists. That's the argument by many people that work in audio description. But again, it does not communicate that emotion that is there in the scene. And as someone else said, the idea of storytelling uh, is no longer telling a story, but it's telling us everything that is, or most of what is in the visual channel. Even things that are not important for the story, it's really not important to the story that she has wavy hair. Really, I've watched the film thousands of times. Really, it doesn't matter. She could have short hair and be blonde, and it would be exactly the same. The sheets could be red, and it would be exactly the same. Okay? So all that is also very important. Now, the Enhancing Audio Description Project looks into trying to address some of those issues, and we do it through the combination of different techniques. The first thing is that at the heart of the project is the idea of personalization. What strikes me as unusual in the field of accessibility is that it is not about diversity, and it's not about inclusion, actually. Many people think when they see a blind person, they think, oh, that's probably like my auntie that's also blind. Probably not. Probably the only thing that they have in common is that they are blind and they're human. That's all. If you ask them what they prefer or how they enjoy watching television, their answers will be very, very different. But we still have one option for accessibility. So we are making an assumption of a group of people being the same just because they're defined by their disability. We have through object-based broadcasting the possibility of changing that. We have the possibility of changing how we send streams of audio to people so that they can make a choice. They can make a choice from things on how loud the music is in the, in the film, which is a big problem for people with visual impairments. You might love the wonderful music montage, but if you can't see anything, that musical montage doesn't actually mean anything. You could change and say, actually, you could modify the amount of audio description. So you can have something very detailed that tells you every color as if it were a fashion show, or you could have something very minimalistic. Or you could have something completely different. You could give people the choice of how they access their audiovisual experiences. So this is what the project is about. And what we're proposing is something that is different to audio description. As you said, the number of verbal descriptions makes the enjoyment of the film in many ways quite challenging. Not just by masking the original soundtrack, but many volunteers I work with tell me the amount of concentration they have to have to be able to follow everything that is said. So by reducing the number of verbal descriptions, this could be something that would be helpful. Sound effects. Now, I'm going to show you a scene uh, later uh, in a little bit that originally, again, was a scene, it was a very, very, very beautiful scene, cinematographically, it was, it's really, really beautiful, uh, with, driven by music uh, and very minimalistic sound effects. When I showed that scene to people with visual impairments, nobody knew what was happening. Absolutely no idea. It was three minutes completely lost. <coughs> they're sitting there feeling frustrated. What we can do is add the sound effects that could have been there. So if someone is walking along the beach, why not put the footsteps back? Why not put the breathing of the characters so that people that cannot see the scene actually say, okay, that there is two characters, I can see that, I can hear them breathing. This is something that can be done very, very simply. Generally, when I give talks about this subject, people say, oh, the money, oh, it's just expensive, all this extra sound effect. It's not true. Because anyone that works as a sound recorders for film knows that you capture much, much more than you could possibly ever use in a film. And people have massive libraries if that's what their job is. So why not take back those things, bring back those things that we're taking out of the sound edit for the formal release and make use of them for the accessible version and make a different experience for those that need it. Spatial audio. There's a lot of talk um, um, lately about um, object-based broadcasting, Dolby Atmos, binaural audio, etc. But there's very little talk about how can that actually help people. It's very based on entertainment. But it can also be useful. We've run tests where we demonstrated that when we separated, um, we spatialized voices, people with visual impairments could suddenly start telling how many people were in a, in a scene much more accurately. So from having no idea it was one or three people, they could tell accurately the number of people. Binaural audio or any uh, sort of spatialization can also tell us what a set is like. So it can tell us there is a grandfather clock to the rear, that there is a door to the right, um, I don't know, a 
table with some drinks to um, the left around, etc. It can give you loads of information. And as a result, you don't have to describe them. Because if they're clear, you don't need that verbal information there. You can do it through using the language of those sound effects and that location. The eye voice. The eye voice is a fancy term uh, developed by uh, Michel Chion that actually means a first person narration. It's a voiceover that actually is from one of the characters and that tells us about their thoughts. We're using it to transform those verbal descriptions that we still need. Someone asked me recently, well, why don't you just do everything in sound effects and spatial audio? It is very difficult to give information, all the information, just with sounds. So a verbal description given in the first person can tell us things like gestures, can identify feelings that sighted people we can derive from looking at someone's facial expression. But if we can't see that facial expression, that information is lost. So the eye voice is that first person narration. So instead of having someone external with that monotonous voice coming in and tell us that the sheets are X color or that the character kind of frowns so they might be unhappy, it's the main character or characters that actually do that form of description. And in this way, turn the piece into an organic piece. Something that you could, some people have called in groups I've run more, po more poetic device. Again, the, the question of money comes up at this point quite a lot. Uh, actors uh, are known for not liking uh, ADRs, so they don't like dubbing. So getting them into the studio to do that is already complicated. You can build it into people's contracts, to be honest. And so that is kind of, might solve that part. Now, other people kind of, I was once, once told I was a utopian. Um, I, I don't think I am. I think that we can also count on people's goodwill. There's lots of actors out there that can pay a lot for disabilities and inclusivities. And I think many people would do it because they think it's the right thing to do. I do really believe so. When we started the project, we, um, I had the task as the principal investigation to put together this advisory panel uh, to steer the project. And uh, one of the things I did is I contact a very renowned dubbing mixer, Howard Barbro, that does things like um, Sher BBC Sherlock, is now doing, um, this is, it, it is public uh, knowledge now, but he will be doing the new Doctor Who series as well. Very, now, very well known, and I contacted him without knowing him, and I told him, look, this is what I want to do. We would really add value to the project if you could support us. We don't have anything to give you. We need in kind contribution. I really thought he was going to say no, to be honest. Uh, and he said the loveliest thing anyone that has contributed to this project in that capacity ever said. He said, actually, I'm going to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. It's like a humanitarian thing to do. So I'm happy to give up my time to make improvements in the field. And I actually think that many people would do it. And at least I would like to believe that they would do it. All these techniques require us to think about accessibility from the start of the film project. If we think about it once we're finished, it's quite complicated. So we need to get script writers involved in writing that first person narration. We need sound recorders to think, okay, what extra things might we want? And of course, dubbing mixers to think about having an accessible stem that uses spatialization, eye voice, and extra sound effects and others to tell that story. So we need filmmakers to be involved. Now, in the case study that we're going to um, be looking at today, that wasn't the case, because we had to first demonstrate that this worked. So we used a film that uh, was done by third-year students at the Department of Theatre, Theatre, Film and Television at York, and we applied these techniques to them. But we're now uh, working on a new phase where we're at, we've actually hired 20 students, uh, and they had the challenge of create um, what well, was a five-minute film, now it's a seven-minute film, but it's okay, um, that considered these guidelines from the very, very start. So they were, we had discussions about what the project was about, what accessibility meant to us, and they've been engaging in creating a film of their choosing and applying this. And it was very interesting to see, for example, how the director started, started asking questions about blocking for actors. So he was thinking about how he could make changes to the way he directed to make it more accessible so that the soundtrack was clearer. So it's been really, really interesting to see the students engage um, with this. And I've seen the rough cut, I haven't seen the final version yet, but uh, looking forward to it. 
Now, how do we know people want these things? There's a lot of projects on accessibility that tend to assume that people want things that they don't want. So, from the start of the project, we worked a lot with the end users, so visually impaired people. So, we carried out surveys. We, um, the surveys were uh, taken by 127 people. We asked them what they thought of current services and what they would like for the future. We then showed them the film you watched the first section of, Pearl, without, in its original format, without any accessibility. And we asked them, we didn't tell them what it was about, we asked them what they understood. Some, some quite unusual interpretations came out, which is what we thought would happen. And then we went with, through the film with them and we pitched ideas as to what we could do with it. And that's, for example, when it came quite evident that we could use sound effects to the, to the greatest purpose. So, for example, in this particular soundtrack, every time uh, in the enhanced version that I'm going to play in a little bit, every time there's something associated with the pearls that she produces, the same sound effects comes up. That same sound effect is in the title credit, the new version. So you slowly create those associations of that's that sound, that's the pearl. And this is something that people were very keen on doing in the focus groups because then we don't need to tell them there's a pearl, there's another pearl, there's three pearls. It becomes quite obvious. We did listening tests uh, to um, look into this idea of spatialization that I talked a few minutes and this is when the idea of, of breaking conventions comes uh, to play. Um, if any of you are in the field of, of soundtracks for film, you know that traditionally, conventionally, we pan the voices to the centre channel. And every main sync sound effects also to the centre channel. Um, unless we want to create the effect, for example, like a car going from left to right or from front to back. Okay? So there is this idea of a screen-centric way of organizing soundtracks that actually comes from film history and the idea that the surround channels didn't have as high quality as the ones that were on the screen. But this is no longer a problem. We can have the same quality all around us. But we still stick to those conventions. By breaking those conventions, we can help visually impaired audiences. Because I said, I said when we start spatializing things, the stories become clear, the elements become clear. Someone told me in a focus group I run just this Wednesday that for her she was now in the middle of the scene. She could tell perfectly where people were going to and from. And that encouraged her to follow the film and feel more engaged. So a great value on that. We then created, we used all that we learned from the focus groups, from the listening test, we created an enhanced version of the soundtrack. And we divided, uh, I think we had about 50 people in individual interviews, and we divided them into three groups. So some people got the original version with no accessibility, other people got the traditional audio description, and others got the new version. And we asked everyone the exact same questions. And the questions were around what they understood the story was about, how many characters there were, how engaged they were, how they felt about their specialization, etc. And we haven't done this yet because we, we do have a lot, we've collected a lot of data throughout the project. But we're now looking into comparing how different uh, responses um, were for the different versions they listened to. But, but what I've seen so far, the enhanced version did receive very, very good scoring um, for its accessibility. We're now in the last uh, phase, that is, we're running focus groups again. Uh, and actually, we have one more that's next week. And we're actually playing the enhanced version that has been tweaked after the interview. So every time people give us feedback, we do look at it again, and we try to make it even better. So the whole group tells us, actually, that is terrible, that doesn't work, I didn't understand what that was. We do go back to it, and we try to make the changes to make it better. But these focus groups that we're doing now are quite interesting because so far we've only worked with vision impaired people. But something that comes across quite a lot is that vision impaired people have maybe partners that are sighted, friends, family members, they want to go to the cinema together, they watch things together at home. And most of sighted people, as, as you said at the start, you didn't quite like the audio description. But there's a social implication there. You can't really switch it off just because you don't like it if your friend that's next to you needs it. If you go to watch an audio described film to the cinema, you have to wear headphones. I've heard some, um, I'm not sure they're funny or sad stories, 
uh, to be honest, but people that told me that they were asked uh, by sighted people in the audience, I'm like, do you really need those headphones? Are you sure you need them? I'm like, pretty sure. Um, or the people themselves that are wearing it feel self-conscious because the volume might be too loud for the person sitting next to them. So they start thinking, oh, I'm bothering someone else. So they end up taking them off. Okay? So it's loads and loads of issues. So in this focus groups, by having both sighted and visually impaired people, we actually ask sighted people as well how they felt about this experience. So would they watch this new accessible version that uses these techniques? So would they be more willing to share it? Um, and it's been so, and again, again, we've just, we're conducting them now, but so far the, the results are really, really positive. And in the Wednesday group we did, uh, both sighted and visually impaired people kind of felt like this is a very, very positive change that they would be willing to do, even though it would take some adjustment to. So everything that is new takes getting used to. But they were really, really happy with, uh, with the results. Now, we're going to listen to a few things. So, kind of the tricky thing here is that uh, the mix is binaural, so we've only been working binaural. So, I have bought wireless uh, headphones for me, with me from York. Uh, there's 16 of them, actually 15, because I'm going to keep one for myself to check that it's working, just in case you tell me you're hearing things and you're not hearing anything. Uh, so what we're doing is, with each sequence, we'll swap who has the headphones. It will also play through the loudspeakers, which means you might have to ride your headphones at a level that allows you to actually hear through the headphones and not through the loudspeakers, okay? So we're going to do that. Just give them to the people you like the most. <laughs> <laughs> I should have made that joke. Now I feel the pressure of. Uh, so I'm not going to look when I get them. Out. <laughs> so if someone smiles particularly enthusiastically, you get. You were smiling enthusiastically. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so. Which is right? The one that says an R, and it's the one that has the volume control in it. The confusing thing about the headphones is that they're working when they're in red and not in green, which is kind of annoying. Um, to switch them on, if you haven't figured it out yet, is the button that says on or off. And you have a volume control as well. So you'll be able to ride the volume um, while we play it. So is everybody okay with the headphones? I hear loads of clicking and one off. There you go. Yep, everybody okay? Okay, so the ones that don't have headphones, you will be listening through the loudspeakers. Find the balance so that you can hear the lap figures, it's going to be quite tricky. So again, you might have to put the headphones on. So this is the same sequence that you watched at the start, but with the enhanced version, so the changed version. Okay, so everybody ready? Okay, let's start. <laughs> full of shadows. The only light is from my window. I face the light, waiting for it to start again. The nurse brings the silver bucket and gets me ready. Mother comes in. I don't know what happened. It's worse this time. She gets the oxygen mask. Something moves under my skin. There's only one way 
Mother takes the bucket away, leaving the nurse to clean me up. And I see, it wasn't that bad. It's all over now. Mother extracts the pearls I have produced for her. And makes a note in her little book. Only two today. It starts again. This time there is blood. Of course, we're used 
to conventions, so we might find it a bit strange that suddenly <coughs> someone that's at the centre of the screen appears from our right. So what we followed is more a theatrical way of panning. So we're following the set more than the cuts of the film. Now I'm going to show you the very, very last scene. Uh, that is the one that used to be more like a musical montage and now is sound effects based. So you're going to get to see the, the, the end of the film. I'm sorry. Spoilers. If anyone wants to change uh, headphones, this is the time to do it. But you might not want to change. Okay. <laughs> Mother and the doctor are not far behind. I just want to get to the sea. Margaret! The waves. Thank you very much for listening.